Good evening folks, it's your resident ooky spooky girly Alexa, back today to talk yet again about Ed and Lorraine Warren, kinda. Now while I've gushed plenty about them before, today's video is a little different. While most of their cases are heavily popularized in today's horror culture, I'd like to change pace and talk about cases and places you'd think they would have been attached to but weren't. Welcome to the top 5 cursed places Ed and Lorraine Warren refused to visit. In 5th place we have the Bija Thomas Octagon House. Mr. Thomas was a rather wealthy man who owned a farm, several textile factories, and and also dabbled in land surveying. He just couldn't keep himself out of monetary debt. And therefore, there are several court records bearing his name, which outline some of his personal assets. Among his personal assets were 12 servants. It is rumored locally that he not only mistreated them horribly, he killed some of them on the property and inside the house. Now, after the passing of Mr. Thomas and his wife, and after the house had passed through the hands of his many children at some point, in the early 1900s, the house became a residence again. Now, during this time, it was apparently difficult to keep any one person in the house for any length of time due to the haunted nature. According to the documentation on this property, no one actually lived in the house any later than the late 1930s. During the 50s, the house became just another building used for storage before being condemned sometime in the late 60s, early 70s. Witnesses say the house is haunted, especially in the dark room or storage room. Apparitions of shackled injured servants and red fluids dripping down the walls have been reported, along with a feeling of being cold in the storage room. In fourth place, we have the Abbey of the Black Hag, locally known as St. Catherine's Abbey or simply as Old Abbey, it's located roughly two miles east of the village of Shanagolden in the townland of Old Abbey. One of the earliest recorded nunneries in Ireland, with its first official record being around 1298, it was built on land donated by John Fitzthomas and has the typical layout for abbeys of its time, with the dining hall, cells, isolated meditation areas, and other rooms still being able to be identified amongst the rooms today. Now, during the 15th century, there was a major battle for supremacy in the area between the Earl Fitzgerald and the prestigious Butler family of of which the earldom of Ormond belonged. It got to such an extent that the local bishop was known to pray for peace between the families at masses. During one of the nightly attacks, Earl Fitzgerald attempted to get his wife to safety, but as he was pulling her onto his horse, an arrow pierced her thigh, shattering the bone and spraying red bodily fluids. As he rode on, the countess appeared to have succumbed to her injury, leading the earl to seek sanctuary at St. Catherine's. The heartbroken man was certain his wife had passed, so he swiftly buried her beneath the altar and continued elsewhere to find safety. As the night went on, the nuns and residents began to hear hair-raising screams and made the decision to rebury the countess in hopes of bringing her peace. When they dug up the body, they discovered that her fingers were broken and her nails had been torn off. The poor woman had been buried alive with a very slow and torturous end of her life. To this day, it is believed that the countess has been unable to find peace and continues to scream in anguish, waiting for her husband to save her from a fate truly worse than death. Now moving slightly ahead in time, we come to the black nun herself. Described as one in the order that wasn't content with being humble, helping others over herself and the servitude to God, she instead craved power. The Hay had her own cell, where she worshipped Satan and performed black magic, becoming a slave to the occult. Now, this was the highest form of blasphemy in the church, and the other nuns in the order fled the abbey, while the Hay remained in her, well, now, house of darkness. To complete her rituals, the black nun would venture into the local community and perform depraved lewd acts and offer sacrifices, with bones of young community members later discovered on the grounds. In modern times, visitors have reported seeing the dark shadowy figure of a nun wandering, the feeling of being constantly watched, and a disembodied hand reaching towards them. It has been reported that flashlights cannot function in the nun's cell, and modern batteries drain way too quickly to have any sort of rational explanation. Now, in third place, we have the Vampire of Highgate Cemetery. In 1967, two teenage girls were walking home along the nearby Swains Lane, claimed to have witnessed the dead rising from their graves by the cemetery's north gate. Another teenager had been awoken one night with something cold and clinging on her hand, which left prominent marks the next morning, while reports circulated of a tall man in a hat walking the area. Before before melting through the cemetery's walls. On Halloween night of 1968, a group of teenagers interested in the occult visited Tottenham Park Cemetery at a time when it was being regularly vandalized by intruders. According to a report in the London Evening News, on November 2nd, the teens arranged flowers taken from graves in circular patterns, with arrows of blooms pointing to a new grave, which was uncovered. A coffin was opened and the body inside disturbed, but their most macabre act was driving an iron stake in the form of a cross through the lid and into the chest of the corpse. In a letter to the Hampstead and Highgate Express on February 6th of 1970, David Ferrant wrote that when passing Highgate Cemetery on Christmas Eve of 1969, he had glimpsed a grey figure, which he had considered to be supernatural, and asked if others had seen anything similar. Sean Manchester claimed David's grey figure was a vampire, and the media quickly latched on, embellishing the tale with stories of the vampire being king of the vampires or of practicing black magic. See, that kind of intrigues me. 
King of the Vampires? I'd be on the first flight to meet him. A rivalry grew between David and Sean, with each claiming that he could, and would, expel or destroy the Spectre. Sean declared that he would hold an exorcism on Friday the 13th of March, which, hey, that's a pretty good spooky date for that sort of thing. ITV conducted interviews with both men, and others who claimed to have seen supernatural figures in the cemetery, which were transmitted early on the evening of the 13th, and within two hours, a mob of hunters from all over London and beyond swarmed over the gates and walls into the Lock Cemetery, despite police efforts to control them. Now, a couple of months later, on the 1st of August, the charred and headless remains of a woman's body were found, not too far from the catacomb, believed to have been used in a black magic ritual. David was found by police in the churchyard beside the cemetery one night in August, carrying a crucifix and a wooden stake. He was arrested, but when the case came to court, it was dismissed. Now, there was more publicity about David and Sean when rumors spread that they would meet in a magician's duel on Parliament Hill on Friday the 13th of April in 1973, which never occurred. Now, in second place, we have Michael Taylor's home in West Yorkshire. In 1974, Michael's wife, Christine, stated to a Christian fellowship group to which they both belonged that his relationship with the leader of the group, Marie Robinson, was carnal in nature. Michael admitted that he felt evil within him and eventually attacked Marie verbally, who screamed back at him. Now, during the next meeting, he received an absolution, but his behavior continued to become more erratic. As a result, the local vicar called in other ministers experienced in the deliverance of preparation to cast out the demons residing within the man. The exorcism, which occurred between the 5th and 6th of October 1974 at St. Thomas's Church in Gobber, was led by Father Peter Vincent, the Anglican priest of St. Thomas's, and was aided by a Methodist clergyman, the Reverend Raymond Smith. According to Bill Ellis, an authority on folklore and the occult in contemporary culture, the exorcists believed that they had, in an all-night ceremony, invoked and cast out at least 40 demons, including those of incest, bestiality, blasphemy, and lewdness. In the end, exhausted, they allowed Taylor to go home, although they felt that at least three demons were still left in him. While at home, Taylor brutally ended his wife, Christine, by attacking her with his bare hands, tearing her eyes and tongue out, and almost tearing her face off. At his trial in March, Taylor was acquitted on the grounds of insanity. He was sent to Broadmoor Hospital for two years, and then spent another two years in a secure ward in Bradford before being released. In first place, we have the Bell Witch in Tennessee. In the early 1800s, John Bell moved his family from North Carolina to the Red River Bottomland in Robertson County, Tennessee, settling in the community that later became the present-day Adams, Tennessee. One day in 1817, John was inspecting his cornfield when he encountered a strange-looking animal sitting in the middle of a corn row. Describing it as having the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit, John fired several times at the being in shock when the animal simply vanished. He thought nothing more of the incident until later that night when the family began hearing thumping sounds outside the walls of their log home. The mysterious sounds continued each night, always growing louder and more forceful. In the weeks that followed, the Bell children began waking up frightened, complaining that rats were gnawing at their bedposts, their bed covers were pulled from them, and their pillows tossed onto the floor by an invisible entity. As time went on, the Bells began hearing faint whispering voices, which were too weak to completely understand, but sounded like a feeble old woman singing hymns. The encounters escalated, and the Bells' youngest daughter, Betsy, began experiencing brutal encounters with this invisible entity. It would pull her hair and slap her relentlessly, often leaving welts and handprints on her face and body. Family had kept the disturbance as a secret until that point in time, but this led to them sharing their story with their neighbor, James Johnson. Now, skeptical at first, and I can't say I blame him, James and his wife spent the night at the Bell home. Things began peacefully, but once they retired for the evening, they were subjected to the same terrifying disturbances that the Bells had been experiencing. After their bed covers were yanked off and James was slapped, he sprang out of bed, exclaiming, In the name of the Lord, who are you and what do you want? The auntie didn't respond for the rest of the night, so it was pretty peaceful for them. Now, the next morning, he explained to the Bells that the culprit was likely an evil spirit, kind that the Bible talks about. The entity's voice strengthened over time, and became loud and unmistakable. It sang hymns, quoted scripture, carried on intelligent conversations, and once even quoted, word for word, two sermons that were preached at the same time on the same day, but 13 miles apart. Word of the supernatural phenomena soon spread outside the settlement, even to Nashville. Then Major General Andrew Jackson became interested in the so-called Bell Witch in 1819, and decided to visit the home to investigate. As Andrew's entourage, made up of several men, well-groomed horses, and a large wagon approached the Bell property, the wagon jolted to a sudden stop. It had become stuck in a muddy creek bed, and the horses were unable to pull it. Well, at least that was what the men thought. After several minutes of cursing and trying to coax the horses into pulling the wagon, Jackson proclaimed, By the eternal boys, that must be the Bell Witch! And suddenly, a disembodied woman's voice told them that they could proceed, and she would see them again later that evening. 
you know, totally not ominous at all. They were then able to proceed across the property, up the lane, and to the bell home. Now that night, one of the men claimed to be a witch tamer, saying his silver bullets would end any evil spirit they came into contact with, and the entity would fear him. Now, um, as your friendly narrator, I can see where this is going. Can you? So immediately after that stupid comment, the man screamed and began jerking his body in different directions, complaining that he was being stuck with pins and hurt severely. A strong, swift kick to the man's, um, lower area from an invisible foot sent him out the door. To the shock and surprise of no one, the entity was angry and announced that there was another fraud in the group, but uh, she'd wait until the next night to identify him. Now terrified out of their minds, Andrew's men begged to leave the bell farm. He insisted on saying he wanted to know who the other fraud was. Now what happened after that isn't super clear, but Andrew and his entourage were spotted in nearby Springfield early the next morning going back to Nashville. He later proclaimed, I would rather fight the British at New Orleans than fight the Bell Witch. The entity continued to express disdain for John Bell, relentlessly vowing to end him. Now John had been experiencing episodes of twitching in his face and difficulty swallowing for almost a year, and it grew worse with time. By the fall of 1820, his declining health had confined him to the house, where the malicious entity continuously removed his shoes when he tried to walk, and slapped his face when he recovered from his numerous seizures. Her shrill voice was heard all over the farm, cursing and chastising old Jack Bell which was the nickname she had given him. John Bell breathed his last breath on the morning of December 20th, 1820, after slipping into a coma the day before. Now, immediately after his passing, his family found a vial of strange black liquid in the cupboard. John Jr. stupidly sprinkled two drops onto the cat's tongue. The cat jumped into the air, rolled over in midair, and it passed before it hit the floor. The entity then exclaimed, I gave old Jack a big dose of that last night, which fixed him. John Jr. then tossed the mysterious vial into the fireplace, where it burst into a bright blue flame and shot up the chimney. Now, over time, young Young Betsy Bell became interested in Joshua Gardner, a young man who lived nearby, and with the blessings of their parents, they decided to marry. Everyone was happy about their engagement. Eh, well, almost. The evil, mysterious entity became furious and repeatedly ordered Betsy not to marry Joshua. The young couple couldn't frequent the river, the fields, or the cave to play without the entity nagging them. The constant pressure was more than Betsy could handle, and on Easter Monday of 1821, she met Joshua at the river and broke off the engagement. Shortly after that, the entity visited her mom, Lucy, and told her that it was leaving, but it would return in seven years. And the entity returned in 1828, as promised. Now, most of the three-week return visit centered on John Jr., making predictions of the future. The entity that tormented the Bell family and the Red River settlement almost 200 years ago is often blamed for the unexplainable manifestations that occur near the old bell farm today. The faint sounds of people talking and children playing can sometimes be heard in the area, and it's not uncommon to see candlelights dance throughout the fields late at night. Photography is especially difficult. Some pictures taken in the area show mist, orbs of light, and other phenomena, including human-like figures who were not present when the pictures were taken. The cause of the Bell family's torment 200 years ago, along with today's continued phenomena in the area, remain a mystery. Numerous theories have all been put forth, but have also all been debunked. Most researchers agree that something had to have caused the incidents at Red River in the early 1800s. That gave rise to the Bell Witch legend as we know it today. And that's the end of today's list and additions to both my I need to visit and avoid at all costs lists. Now all these places either had the events happen during the Warrens' lifetime or were noted haunted places during their most active years, leaving my curiosity to wonder why they didn't visit them. What do y'all think? Be sure to let me know in the comments, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more cursed content from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos.